What is up, guys? We're back with a new sound advice. And I'm actually kind of excited about this one because we're going to be talking about box design. That's going to be with subwoofers. It's going to be with regular speakers. We're going to be talking all kinds of things. And you guys might have questions about box design. That's okay. We might be able to answer them. <laughs> or, or not. Who knows? <laughs> or not. You know, you know, the one thing that I love about our crowd is when we can't answer them, we usually have people on there that, that do have answers for us, which that, is great. That, that is true. The amount of expertise and the amount of skill that exists inside of our community, it just, it just blows me away. I'll give a, I'll give an example. Um, you might see him on here sometimes when he has a chance to jump in. He's on lots of the live streams. Uh, Stu, uh, Stu's customs. Uh, he, uh, he builds boxes in the evenings and works at a, at a shop during the day. And he's just, Man, he makes some great stuff. He and our friends on Facebook, he'll shoot me pictures of things he's working on. And it's just the, the amount of skill that's out there, you know, in the professional world, in the in the hobbyist and amateur world like I live in. Um, I don't know. Nick, do you still consider yourself a hobbyist and an amateur or <laughs> or not? I consider myself all kinds of things, and you don't want to know half of them. <laughs> But here, here's what I would say, and this is one of the things that I think I do want to get to at some point today. I watched a video not too long ago where basically someone had blown their subwoofer up by just playing RMS of the subwoofer. We only <sighs> did RMS on the subwoofer and the subwoofer blew. And we, I, I would like to talk about at some point in time why... RMS to a large degree doesn't matter. <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is, well, we, you'll figure it out when we talk about box design. What right. What is RMS and does box design have anything to do with it? Because it does. Yes. yes. And, and also frequency might have something to do with that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, along the same lines, one thing we can talk about tonight when we get around to it is just actually how much power do you actually need in order to drive a speaker? Uh I mean, I, I noticed that every time I do a uh, a test with a smaller amplifier, like one of the smaller Arlick boards or the uh, KAB board that I did this weekend, people are always like, oh, wow, that thing doesn't have enough power. That sucks. It's not, it's not huge amounts of power. It's like we don't need huge amounts of power, especially for home audio. If you're just talking about a system to sell on your computer desk or a system to stick in your bedroom, you're not talking about your home theater subwoofer or you're not talking about a big loud car stereo. You, know, you don't need that much power. You're probably not using as much power as you think you are. Yeah. So with that said, let's go ahead and uh, first kind of mention the top three box designs, uh, which are, and, and there's variations of these, so we're not going to pretend there aren't, but we're just going to talk about the three main ones for right now. There's there's sealed. Mm -hmm. I want to do it this way. There's sealed, there's ported, and then there's passive radiator. Those and then there's ones. all the combinations and factorials of all those you could possibly do. Yes. So some people might say, well, there's infinite baffle. Well, that's just a large sealed. There's free air. Same thing. Okay. Large free. A, a band pass is just an overly complicated uh, uh, ported enclosure that doesn't perform as well as a ported enclosure half the time. So let's talk about this. First of all, Justin, what is your favorite? Do you have a favorite type of box? Okay. So this is this is something that I've been waffling on a little bit lately. Um, and you can see this kind of in my videos. You're making for me the, hungry. <laughs> for the wow. longest time. Well, first of all, I've got a little bit of, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, I've got a bit of a fetish when it comes to passive radiators. Um, I just, I, I like passive radiators. There's something about them that's like, hey, that's really cool. There's this extra cone there. Sure, it's not a powered cone, but it's cool because it does the same thing that a port does. And um, and I think there's some huge opportunities for 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 building great enclosures into really tight, small spaces with passive radiators. But ultimately, when you start looking at output, performance, um, and a little bit of degraded sound quality, I've always been a ported guy. I've always been of the opinion the only time you should ever use a sealed enclosure is if um, you don't have room for a proper size ported enclosure. But I've been beginning to change my mind on that just a little bit and i'm beginning to think maybe i was wrong <laughs> well that's good because some people would definitely uh, uh say you are well <laughs> well you know shame well, on them for being wrong they're allowed to be wrong too now uh <laughs> so are there any so besides extension what what are there any other reasons why you choose one over the other efficiency and increased low end extension is what so, you get with the ported enclosure 
Right. So when we talk about efficiency, what we're talking about is efficiency in the lower frequencies. It means that they can right. play lower, louder. Yes. Um, without the help of your room. Without the help of DSP or equalization. Well, or without the help of whatever room or cabin, whatever, gain. cabin gain, whatever, yeah, whatever you're putting it in without right. that. So I'm going to talk about something here. And this is actually on my website. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen real quick. Oh, cool. Yeah, do that. Now. Did you just freeze? Did your camera freeze and your mic both? Nick's been having a lot of uh, technical difficulties over the last few of our sessions. Uh, he lost power the last time we went live. Uh, maybe the chat's not moving. Maybe I'm the one that's frozen. No. Oh, here, here he's back. Somehow I went to share the screen and everything closed out. It just didn't. Oh, did it again. <laughs> technical difficulties. All right. Well, while Nick is trying to get that sorted out on his end, can someone in the chat please verify that I'm still operating live? Can anybody there tell me if they uh, what they're seeing on their end? David K gave us a thumbs up, or El Fuego gave us a thumbs up saying hi to David K. That's the last right. comment that I've seen. Well, okay. I'm just going to say right now that for whatever reason, it's not letting me share a screen. So I'm just going to talk to you. I have a, uh, I'll go ahead and throw this actually in the chat. This is just a link to my website. Okay. Is this the uh, sealed reported? What should I do that you shared in the private chat a few minutes ago? It, it is, but it's not a lot. Every time I press share screen, it closes out of Google Chrome for some reason. No, don't uh -huh. know why. So we'll let you guys click on that link. But basically what this is, is there's a sealed reported and there's something called efficiency bandwidth product. This is something Vance Dickinson talked about in his loudspeaker design book, uh, cookbook. And the basic premise is if you take your FS, your QES, it, it's going to give you your EBP. Now your EBP is what we call efficiency bandwidth product. Depending on what that number is, it's going to depend on what that speaker is going to. Here, I've got the share up. You want to go ahead and hit the share button on, on my end? You can see it. I'll try to. Hey, all right, good. That's the one so, right there. It did. So if you scroll down to the EBP, this is a formula. And this is a calculator. You can just go on the website anytime you want and use this calculator. It's free. There's nothing to do. I just put this up for those that want to figure that out. So if you put in your FS of whatever number you want, just make up a number there. So put an FS of, you know, whatever you want, then you put in your QES, it's going to give your EBP. If that number is closer to 50, the better it is for a sealed box. The closer it is to 100, the better it is for a ported. If it's something like 75, then it's it might work good for either one. So this is a calculation that people have been using for years, figuring out whether that subwoofer is going to work well in a ported or sealed enclosure. So a lot of times when your EBP uh, is set more for a closed box. QES is always between zero and one. Is that correct, Nick? Uh, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. Okay. So what what you're seeing here is he's he's doing different QES. I'm sorry, QES EBP calculations. So the closer it is to fifty, the closer it is for a sealed box. So if you put like a sealed driver in a ported box you might see the frequency response instead of going straight across you might see it go straight and then dip down low and then peak again and then go down at the the port tuning so so i'm gonna get a little mathy on us here okay nick um so the qes is always going to be between zero and one uh, do you know what ES stands for? Q is the quality factor, uh, which I have no idea what the hell that is. It's just some unitless unit of measure. Um, uh, ES, any idea what ES stands for? I don't know that what all these things stand for. But basically, you're always going to be dividing by a fraction. And because of that, as the resonant frequency gets larger, the EBP goes up. So for a given QES, a larger, you know, a higher frequency for your resonant frequency is going to lean you more towards ported and lower frequency is going to lean you more towards sealed. Uh, not, not necessarily. Uh, well, that's what the calculation says. So here's an okay. FS of 20 and a QES of 0.5. So if you hold the QES constant and lower the resonant frequency, it leans more towards sealed. The problem is you're, you're getting a little ahead of yourself because because QES and FS are tied together mathematically. Correct. When one changes, the other one changes. Exactly. Sorry, this is this is how my mind thinks. Y'all just got a glimpse into what I think of when I look at math. So so yeah, it's 
that's not as simplistic as you're making it. So let's do, for example, the Ultimax 18. The Ultimax okay. 18 has a resonant frequency of 19.5. Good Lord. Yeah. That's freaking awesome. And it's QES is 0.62. Now this is actually going to teach you. It's EBP is 31. So what does that tell us about the Ultimax 18? Well, according to this, it needs to go in a sealed enclosure, but I it, think that's wrong. Typically it says it's better for a sealed enclosure. Better for a sealed enclosure. And so these are what we call, uh, th these are not to be set in stone. These are things to think about when you're designing it. We all know the Ultimax 18 does really good in all of those. And a lot of that has to do with this X-Max. It has a large amount of X-Max. So it can be put in free air. It can be put in infinite baffle. It can be put in sealed. It can be put in ported, and it does well in all of them. Right, right. So there's another ratio down there, if you go further down the page, that talks about just the QTS. And it's not a ratio. I, I apologize. So the, the QTS is, so uh, you need, the, there's there's three Q numbers, and they're all mathematical combinations of each other. So if you know two of them, WinSD will give you the third one. Correct. And as long as you know the QTS, you don't need to know anything else. Scroll back up. Go ahead and tell them what the QTS is. The Q of a driver, this right here? Yeah, so... Anything above 0.4 to 0.7 of the Q is best suited for sealed. You see that third, fourth sentence? If sound? you're looking at the QTS, if this number is 0.4 or below, it's typically best suited for a ported enclosure. Correct. Anything from 0.4 to 0.7 is suited for sealed. And any number above 0.7 is good for free air or infinite baffle. In other words, if you're trying to find a good mid base driver, a good mid range to put in your car door, you want a QTS above 0.7. Yeah, because a car door is considered, and there, there's no enclosure, right? So it's right. basically considered car free just air. A bunch of holes near each other, and you jam a speaker in one of those holes. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's basically free air. And, and that's what I try to tell people typically is when they're saying, hey, I got a car speaker. What should I use then? Yeah, typically just build a sealed box you'll be fine <laughs> that's what it's typically designed for because we all know uh free air or infinite baffle is basically just a large uh a large uh port a sealed box i don't know why i can't speak today pop pop down in the comments living loud with andy ask a question how do they ever factor the evp of what is better more of an estimate or is there more science behind that and uh, Elliot Designs, of course, pops in with the answer. The ranges are guidelines. Uh, there's yes, a bit of leeway are. in these guidelines. Um, my opinion on the matter is I don't think there's actually that much science but behind this. Because what we just talked about with the Ultimax, you throw any of the Ultimaxes in any enclosure you want, and they just they perform well. Uh, it, the, sure, the, the magic number says that you want to put that Ultimax in a sealed enclosure, but you don't. <laughs> Well, you will notice, though, when you go into WinISD and you do some of these that have EVPs that do tailor more towards a sealed. And I'm not saying you have to. A couple things might happen. One might be your response. Your response, instead of like, say you're going to put it in a Chevy Chev style uh, enclosure, which tells us that our base response should be linear up until our tuning frequency, and then it'll drop. Uh, a lot of these that are designed more for a sealed will often go start linear and then drop and then pick back up and then drop again. So there will actually be a little dip in that area. Another thing that you might notice is they might meet their excursion faster as well. Uh, now, all of this, like we said, is are just guidelines, but EBP and QTS is one of the ways that you can start to look at whether that box, whether that speaker, I should say, should perform well in a sealed or ported enclosure. I, I just so happen, Nick, to have uh, Win ISD pulled up on my computer right now, and I've got the Ultimax 18 uh, queued up to kind of go into um, to, to look at what this stuff looks like. So if you want to do another share there real quick, and we can take a look at that. Yeah. All right. Well, so, and the driver you, integrity checked out okay. <laughs> can you enlarge that all the way? As big I as you don't can. think I can, uh, but that's all right, because... Because the first thing it's going to do is ask you the number of drivers, and then it will calculate the EVP. As you can see, it's the exact same calculation that Nick's uh, Nick's calculator came up with, and um, and so this 18, um, if we do a QTC of 0.707, we can get an interesting uh, transfer response here. Let's see, that's it right there. And wow, that actually looks pretty good. That's kind of that's kind of flat all the way down to you know 50 hertz or so. So that's really cool. 
And that's typically where your room's going to pick up a lot mm -hmm. of times. So a lot of people with something like the Ultimax 18, you really can use it sealed with no issues. Yeah, it would, it would do fine sealed, it looks like. I mean, but I think you'll get more low-end extension. And it won't take me just a second to pull it up here. Let me find my Dayton Audio. So when we talk about low-end extension, one of the things we should be talking about, too, is when we're doing these graphs in WinISD, this is called an anechoic response, meaning there is no room, okay? So when we put these in a room, we will get low-end extension that we're not seeing on the graph. Right, right, because you, know, you can model that in WinISD, but this right here is, um, <laughs> here's one. The box is, uh, it's huge. It's 593 <laughs> liters. Hang on. Let me get that to something we can actually, 20, 20, uh, 20 cubic foot box that's tuned to 14 hertz, and it plays all the way flat down to 20. So uh, that's, of course, completely unrealistic. Let's put it in something a little bit more realistic, and you can see the difference in the output. Let's turn up, let's do a more reasonable tuning frequency. And this is the reason why you would want to go with the sealed version of this, the green line here. Let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Is that better? Not much. The green line, you just, you just get more output. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> That's that's why. Uh, Eric R has a question you're going to want to answer, Nick. Uh, is isobaric box still a thing? It is. I, I I built the ISO 100, which is a fantastic subwoofer. Uh, you should look it up. It's on YouTube. It uses four twenty uh, twelve four. Is it ten or twelve inch? Uh, the ten inch four ten inch. It was the um, yeah. Yeah, four 10-inch GRS subwoofers, and they are an isobaric. The reason why isobaric isn't as big a thing anymore is because typically the cost of drivers are just so expensive that adding them doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, and they're typically designed not to have to use as large of an enclosure minus the GRS because the GRS are, are designed almost to be replacement speakers of older speakers right so right they're, they're specifically grs stands for great replacement speaker this is if you if you pick up a, some speakers at a yard sale for 10 bucks and you need a pair of 12s to throw in there and there's something from the 80s that's what they're made for uh and they work they work well in a wide variety of enclosures the other thing to remember too you know the, the woofers have changed uh woofers have more motor force and the thing that an isobaric does is it doubles the motor force relative to the cone area uh cone area stays the same motor force doubles um, and so, so I want to answer Jason Stokes question. Jason says, Hey man, I've designed or seen a few enclosure designs on WinSD that didn't respond as much as the graph said it would. What's up with that? This goes back to what I said earlier that it's a lie. RMS is a lie. It's not really a lie. It's just, most people don't understand it being a lie. And you know what? I, I can't share my screen for whatever reason. So can you pull up? a uh a, any ported subwoofer that's not the ultimax 18. i mean any, ultimax 18 would work but just any ported one let's see here just something like a normal subwoofer oh a normal subwoofer this one's not normal this is an eminence 21 inch driver that i've just pulled up here that's you mean just like on the screen go find one or what do no, you, you mean can, the eminence 20 uh, the eminence 21 would probably be all right but what are you, you looking know, for you're looking just, for just a website or you want it, it in win isd no, no, just pull it up in WinISD. Pull up, uh, pull up the twelve-inch Ultimax. Just do that. I got. Uh, I got. Uh, give me just a second here. Yeah, let me go through all the all the combinations. All right, we're here. just going to talk about it because it's going to take him a while. So basically, when you look at a design in WinISD, there's a lot of reasons why it may not respond the way that you think it would be. And that's because most people stay on one screen in WinISD. They stay on the transfer function magnitude. So what does the transfer function magnitude really say? It says, hey, if we didn't have to worry about anything else, this is how the driver would perform. The problem is there are other things we have to worry about, such as over excursion, such as maximum power. Uh, how much power can we truly give a speaker? And the box that you design is going to depend on how much power you can give it and at what frequency you can give it that power. And so one of the ways that we can look at this is if we're in WinISD and we scroll up to graphs and we go to say um, max power. Yeah, I got it. All right, let's add this to stream. So go ahead and go, this is the 12 inch Ultimax? Uh, yes. Okay, whatever. Just go ahead and go to uh, maximum power. 
Oh wait, I need to go into the signal and give it some power. What's the what's the what's the rating of a twelve inch Ultimax? Like? I don't know. Just, just give it a thousand watts. Just five hundred watts. There we go. There's the SPL. All right, just go to. Uh, we we're talking to about maximum power. Go to maximum power. power. Uh, not, not getting anything. Maximum power. Power. There we go. Aha. All right, you have something wrong with your. your yeah, data. it's not. Uh, yeah, see. something's not right. So let me just explain what you should be seeing because that's not working correctly. So if you have your data incorrect and you put in maximum power, what it's going to show is a straight line and then it's going to dip off or it might even show a decrease in that maximum power. Anywhere that maximum power is, it's going to show that that line is not straight at. It's going to show you where that might be. Now, say you ported it at 35 hertz mm -hmm. and you have a dip at 35 hertz of maximum power that says, hey, this can only take 300 watts, even though your subwoofer RMS theoretically should be able to do 500 watts because of the way that you ported it, it could really only handle 300 watts at that frequency and below. And any ported subwoofer after your um, tuning frequency, that maximum power is going to drop off like a cliff. So if you're playing, say, 20 hertz signal and you've tuned your subwoofer to 35 hertz and you're paying, playing your RMS on it, you're going to blow your subwoofer. It's so, going um, to happen. Now, look out, it might be a matter of time, but it will happen. So I just I just threw up a cone excursion plot. Is that what you're talking about? What? Cone excursion? Is that what you're talking about? There's the cone excursion. No. Well, yeah, it, it will be cone excursion, but cone excursions, when you look at the cone excursion graph, that's only going to be dependent on how much power you've give it, given it. You should have a maximum power. See, something's not right in your... You are correct. It's not showing up. And there's some, when, whenever you put in your... And this is one of those things you have to make sure that uh, your data got inputted correctly. You're missing something, maybe right. excursion or something. I don't know what what you're missing, but you're missing one of those. That's going to tell you what it is. Unfortunately, I can't share my screen tonight, and yeah. I don't know why. Everything else is working as well. That's the way it goes sometimes. It is what it is. But the basic premise is you will have uh, an over excursion at some point on that graph when it's ported. And you need to make sure to pay attention to that power output at that excursion level. Yep. <laughs> I have no idea why my WinISD is not uh, running properly. That's okay. Uh, it happens sometimes. You might just need to restart it. It, it all depends. Oh, yeah. But, but here's the things that you need to do. When you build a box in WinISD, instead of just paying attention to transfer function mag magnitude, go to the signal, which is what Justin did, and input the wattage that you think you're going to be sending. If you think you're going to be sending 1,000 watts, put 1,000 watts in there and then pay attention to uh, your maximum power. That's going to tell you how much maximum power you can really give it. It's going to show that by frequency. And right. then you're also going to pay attention to your maximum SPL. If you pay attention to your maximum SPL, it's going to show you if there's any parts or problems in your design because it might dip down low. So if you're giving it 500 watts, but then it dips down low, it's saying, hey, the driver can't handle that 500 watts in that area. So when ISD is, is only important if you pay attention to all the graphs. I would tell people, go through all your graphs and look at them. If you don't know what they are, get on the forum, Toys DIY Audio, and ask the question. We would be happy to help you over there. So along the same lines about power, um, I, I think people misunderstand how much power a speaker actually ends up using. Uh, and this is something that I uh, have been playing around a little bit since I've got my hands on one of those AMM ones. Uh, you can hook those things up and you can watch in real time as you're playing music. And it's really, really rare to ever get all of the power out of an amplifier. And over the last little bit of time, last few weeks, I've tested some small amplifiers, some uh, like the Dayton Audio, Audio KEB board that I just did. Some of those are acrylic boards. And people look at it and they'll comment, oh, hey, it only does you know, you know 50 watts or whatever the case may be. And that's garbage. Why would you want that? It's like, well, you know what? Like your mids and highs, they're not using 50 watts, even in like a high-end car stereo system with tons of power. Tweeters don't actually need or use a lot of power. Yeah. And, and you're only going to get the maximum power out of your subwoofer amplifier if you are um, wiring it down into the dirt and just cranking the hell out of it. 
Absolutely. And, you know, we talked about this too. Uh, doubling the power gives you about three decibels, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's not double the output. It's not nope. double the sound. It's not till six decibels that you double the perceived volume. So that would be, what, four times the power, right? And, and a decibel is the smallest amount of change in volume that a human being can hear. So three decibels is three very small incremental changes. It's not a lot louder. Yeah, they actually say that three decibels is the first time you can really tell, like you audibly can usually tell a difference. Um, not saying that you shouldn't be able to tell a difference. One decibel, three decibel is where they say you actually can tell. Oh, yeah, you'll definitely notice it, but it's not twice as loud, twice as much power, not twice as loud. Yeah, and that's that's where I think we get because a lot of people say, "Hey, I'm I, jumping up from an 800 watt to a thousand watt. Is that going to make a big difference?" And the majority of the time, the answer is no, not really. I'm not saying it's not going to make a difference. I'm just going to say it's not as much as you might think it will be. Correct, correct, correct. Nick, I got a question for you. Um, I mentioned it earlier when you asked me, you know, what are my favorite types of enclosure designs. Um, so my question for you is how has your philosophy about designing a speaker changed over time? What are things that five years ago, if you would have asked Nick a question today, you might give a different answer. Well, first I need to say Larry's right. It's plus 10 decibels and I, I messed up, but you're right. Plus 10 decibels is the perceived doubling of the output. Thank you. That's correct. Larry. And one decibel is noticeable. That's, so, that's how they define the decibel and they create it. Now, what were you saying now? So what is what has changed in your like philosophy and, and your logic of designing speakers? If you were to, to say five years ago, find Nick and ask Nick a question about designing a speaker, what would change between then and, and now? So I'm not going to say necessarily something that changed in the past five years, but I will say one of the things that uh, I think has changed in general is the golden ratio. A lot of people used to live by the golden ratio, which was 0.62 to 1 to 1.62 which is the ratio to height, width, and depth. or width, my, my, depth, my, BS, width and my height, BS actually. meter is going off here. I don't believe in such things as golden ratios in, well, in any aspect of the world. I, I'm not going to say it, there, it's based off of the, the number pi. And the whole point was, hey, that when you put this in the box, if you keep that golden ratio, it should reduce the amount of reflections in there. And that should theoretically sound the best. Uh, in theory, it I, I guess theoretically it should, but hardly anyone lives hard and fast by that rule anymore. And I would say that it's one that I, I wouldn't pay attention to. And most good designers are going to tell you the same thing. It's not that important. But it's based off of pi. What, what's going on there? I have I don't know, man. I'm just telling you, I, I am not a mathematician. I am telling you what I have learned. I all I know is Apple. Lemon meringue, definitely. <laughs> Banana cream pie, for sure. French silk, eh, not really. But, you know, there's some good ones. There's some bad ones. So Paul says, how can he not believe in the golden ratio? This dude's a joke. Huh. It's funny that he says that because uh, name any speaker out there right now that uses the golden ratio, there's there's hardly any. And if you look at any of your hi-fi, high-end ones, none of them use, utilize the golden ratio. You know, you can take a look at it and you can take a look at the design of a speaker box for that matter. The design of a speaker box, we know what design of a speaker box is going to give you the best sound output. And yet most of the people still use a rectangular box. Why? Because mm -hmm. it's the easiest one to produce. Easy to build, it? right. Yeah. And that's not to say it's going to give you the, the least amount of deviations from your frequency response. That's just not true. But yeah. The, the logic of the golden ratio has to do with um, frequency response or, or rather has to do with standing waves inside the box, reflections inside the enclosure. Is that right, Nick? Yes. It has to do with basically, yeah, exact resonances inside your enclosure. Correct. So my question is, well, which frequency of resonance are we trying to control with the golden ratio? And, oh. and that is what Elliot has answered. The golden ratio mostly matters for high frequencies, uh, mostly matters for high frequencies, but it doesn't matter that much. And that's the issue with the golden ratio. Sure, it's going to be nice at some particular frequency. Which one? Why is that one special? And when we talk about the golden ratio, obviously we're talking about the golden ratio in speaker design because that's what we're talking about today. No one's saying that there's 
the golden ratio in general isn't important, but we're saying it's less important than we first originally believed. And you know what? I think we can point that to that a lot in design that sometimes we can look at something theoretically and say, hey, theoretically, this should make a huge difference. And then when we do it in actual practice, the difference really doesn't matter as much as we thought it would. Elliot Designs mentioned one uh, ratios developed by Spiral, uh, which is described by Pi. You find it everywhere and so forth and so on. I feel like that one was Avogadro's number, wasn't it? Wasn't that, wasn't that one Avogadro's number, Elliot? And, and he's absolutely right. It's everywhere in natural, nature. And it, and it is considered ideal. What we found out in speaker design, though, is that even though it's ideal, doesn't mean that it makes the biggest difference that you would typically think. Well, you know, what I, what I run into in, um, you know, outside of the speaker building world is there's these ratios of, that you can actually allegedly use for like uh, picking stocks and stuff like that, that there'll be waves, uh, you know, seven ups, you know, in each up cycle, seven downs in each down cycle or something like that. And it's like, it's not, there's no science behind it. It's just all speculation. So a lot of this golden ratio stuff, I'm really, really doubtful that you can use these as predictive tools. Yeah, I'm not going to say there's no science behind it because there is, but it just, like I said, it doesn't make as big of a as big of a thought as we thought it would be. And the biggest point to take away here is design the box in the way that best suits what you need it to. Okay, um, there are going to be different things that we could talk about, such as the, the baffle, things that I would say would make much greater impact than. The golden ratio. All right. Harry 72 nailed, nailed it when I was looking for. Uh, I think he misspelled it, but he also said he didn't spell it right. Uh, the Fabacini sequence or something like that. I'm, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, that's where the spirals come from and everything. And there's a question in the chat that I think is worth looking at real quick. Where did it go? It was uh, Eric R. Eric R. asked, does the speaker define what box to use or vice versa? Well, that's what we were talking about with EBP, right? So the Once speaker does define what box to use. So you take a speaker and design a box around it, as opposed to taking a box and looking for a speaker that will work in it. Well, you can do either one. I mean, you do that a lot with like speaker cabinets you already have that you want to re reuse, right? If you do, you try to find one that works with inside that volume well. They figured out the sequence. Um, I can't pronounce it still. Uh, regular guy and Nick both uh, and Eric are all, all hit it one right after the other. Uh, Paul as well. Um, <laughs> it's it's Fibonacci. Fibonacci. Okay, Fibonacci. So, uh, you know, this is what Eden's is talking about. Eden's, let me let me pull up box shapes for you because there's there's a great one on audio judgment that talks about box shapes, and we're going to show you what it does to your frequency response because that's kind of where we're going with with box shapes, and there are what we would consider. Um, ideal boxes box shapes truth the matter is most of you may not be able to utilize these but let's let's show you anyway hey we got a super chat baba thank you so much for your support we really appreciate that thank you let me go ahead and highlight that thank you hey i'm going to send you this link so you can pop it up since mine are not working okay all right what, what are you sending me this is a link to well in a minute i'm going to send you a link to uh the different box sizes or the bit different box shapes. I'm sorry. The box shapes. Um, so the question that was asked is the, the, how does the box shape affect the sound? And that's what we're trying to kind of, kind of dance around a little bit like a trapezoid or whatever the case may be. Um, I, I've never been of the opinion that the box shape internally mattered that much, but like the baffle matters a lot especially when dealing with a, a mid-range speaker or dealing a, like a, you're building the bookshelf speaker for home audio. So in my opinion, the box shape is important for that. But as far as, is there some magic shape that's going to make the, um, uh, <laughs> make the interior better. And that's the problem I have with that magic number or whatever, that golden ratio. Uh, Paul so asked, aren't boxes square by definition? Well, we should use the word enclosure, I suppose. Paul is correct. Oh, he's yeah, he is right. So the different enclosure will actually take different enclosure size is more about how it's going to reflect off of the outside of the enclosure itself, not off of the, um, and we're not talking about the internal enclosure at this point in time. We're talking about the external. Like if you do a sphere, for example, it's the less, it's the most, the least amount of deviation that you're going to have 
Uh, a box is one of the worst. I'm trying to find it right here. And unfortunately, I, I didn't have this. Hold up. So we'll, what's your... we'll, we'll come back to it when we get when we pull it up for you guys. Okay? I, I think I know what we're talking about here. The um, the idea is if you had a, the, the perfect speaker sitting in your living room, uh, it would be a, a full range driver mounted in a sphere. Or a, or a hemisphere so that you've got the, no baffle diffraction around the outside. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, whereas the absolute worst thing you could do would be to mount that, say, you know, full range driver, that mid range driver into the center of a circle. Uh, uh, so if you had a, a tube shaped speaker and you mounted it in the center of the circle, you're going to get some terrible reflections and refractions off of the baffle. And it's just going to sound like garbage. All right. See what else we have in the chat. It's baffling. Did you find it yet, Nick? No, but why don't you talk a little bit about passive radiators while I pull this up? Because you, you know, I can always talk about passive radiators. There's some so, myths about passive radiators. Like, how many do you need? There are a couple of myths about passive radiators. And the one that I keep always going back to is the myth that you need two passive radiators for every active driver. That's not the case. What you need is you need your passive radiator to be able to displace twice the amount of air as the active driver. And we got another super chat, living loud with Andy. Thank you for your super chat. We really appreciate it, man. Uh, that matters a whole lot, especially when other content creators drop super chats on us. That's uh, that's one of the best compliments you can give somebody is to drop a super chat on them. Um, so um, uh, you just need the passives to be able to displace twice the amount of air. You can get that lots of different ways. If the passive has double the excursion, uh, so uh, uh, it's the X limit. The mechanical limit of the, of the passive has to be double the X max of the active. And you can have the same size cone. That's what Kicker does on their enclosures. You can do one passive, two actives. You can do a 10 inch active with a 12 inch passive. Lots of lots of cool stuff like that you can do. So you don't need two passive radiators for every active driver. And that's one of those things that uh, it's, it's a myth that we need to debunk. Yeah, and I can't find this. So if I do find it later, guys, what I'll do is I'll just add it as a as a as a what you call it. There you go. As a pinned comment. That'll work. And then or you guys. Stick it in there. Well, if I find it before we leave, then I'll I'll do that. But the basic premise is there are different shapes of boxes that do make a difference in sound quality. And then, the, of course, the, the question is, at that point in time, is how much do you really want to put into that? So what some people will do is they'll take salad bowls from Ikea, and they'll cut out speakers and put them in there to get that better response. I always thought it'd be cool if I could find a clear acrylic bowl, but I can't find one that's not really crazy expensive and and <laughs> and, and, and not thin, right? But a clear acrylic bowl would be cool. That'd be it make for a good look. Now, that's one of those things, Nick, we worry a lot when we're building home audio speakers, but if you're doing car audio, you have no control over that. You're just mounting it wherever you can in the car, or maybe you're doing a build out or a pod, but you're just going to you know, you're just stuck with what you've got in a car. So I'm not going to say you have no response. I'm going to say you have less because you definitely can with the right placement, make something that's going to affect it. But you have a lot, you have, unfortunately your en enclosure, which is your car is going to have a lot of reflections in general. It's, it's basically you're, you're, you're putting a speaker in the absolute worst possible environment when you're putting it in a car and not from like a harshness of the environment from a standpoint of you can't get you're not you're off you're, you're off uh, axis when you're listening to a speaker in a car. Things are just wrong. Yeah. Well, I can't find that. That's, That's OK. Crazy. I, I, I have found this so many times without even trying to find it. It's just hilarious that now when I look for it, I can't find it. All right. So. Yeah, and that's the truth about passive radiators. So passive radiators, you don't need two of them, you, but you do need to make sure that it can handle it. Now, in WinIC, there's another way you can check that out. And when I see with a passive radiator, you want to go to your graph. Uh, typically, you're going to go to uh, – uh, there's three different ones for passive radiator. There's transfer function magnitude, transfer function phase, and cone excursion. And that will be all, say, PR at the end. That stands for passive radiator. The cone excursion for the passive radiator is the one you're going to want to look at. When you click on the cone excursion of the passive radiator, you make sure you put your input power in your signal once again. So if you're giving it 100 watts or whatever, you're going to see if that passive radiator isn't is going to be enough. So for example, with the five and a half inch 
Tang Band. I can't find any small passive raiders that do a great job with that if I want to get all the way down as low as I can and give it maximum power. You hit the screen I, share. I can show you that what that looks like in WinISD real quick. Okay. So what I often do is with that five and a half inch, since it has a lot of excursion, what I end up doing instead is I use uh, an eight inch passive radiator. So and this that is will actually work. This is the opening screen in, in WinISD. So this is the transfer function magnitude. And up at the top, you hit that pull down menu and you've got this range of stuff here for the passive radiator. And what Nick is talking about is the cone excursion for the passive. And in this example here, in anything below 30 hertz, uh, this passive radiator goes completely wild and, and rips itself apart. So <laughs> that's not a good design, which is why I never built this one. So, um, a couple other plots for the passive radiator. There's a, a transfer function magnitude for the passive radiator. This is telling you how much output is coming from the passive as opposed to the actual driver. You can get the same thing for the port. And what you can see happening here is that at the low frequencies, the passive is taking over and doing doing the work. Uh, that's what's going on there. I was trying to design something that was relatively flat. Uh, I need to go back to this. I think this might be, I may have actually built this one. I think I may have ran this sitting on the back seat of my truck for about a year. So um, if you want to click on your private chat, I sent you the uh, list to what a different website, but it has it. So we'll show you this. Oh, a gentleman's guide for improving loudspeakers. Um, sure. Well, if you first scroll Gentleman's guy, I thought, uh-oh, what did you send me? Just scroll down to the picture. All right. <laughs> and the gentleman's guide. We're looking at pictures in a gentleman. This is what Nick was talking about earlier. So, uh, so we're talking about diffraction. Yeah, so it's diffraction off the baffle, right? So if we talk a look, uh, if we take a look at a completely circular baffle, we have the least amount of diffraction. Yes. As you can see, you can see that via the, the non-squiggly lines, okay? Anytime you see a squiggly line, that's diffraction off of this particular case. And you can see pretty clearly this drop is called the baffle step. That's a, uh, so if you're heard people talk about baffle step, um, as the frequency gets lower, you get less output um, because of the, I'm not sure what the science is. That's the baffle step. So, well, it's because at that frequency, the sound waves are actually wrapping around the enclosure. Around the enclosure. So they're going around the back where you can't hear them. And depending on the size of your enclosure depends on, or the size of the baffle depends on what frequency that, wrapping starts at this one so, right here the red one uh this so, is one this is the ahead. worst wing this is the worst thing you can possibly do it's basically um you know the, the old school bazooka base tubes right if it were you know it's base so it doesn't matter so much this is more for your mid-range and tweeter kind of stuff uh, but uh but if you were to put a mid-range or a tweeter in a in a cylinder and fire out the end of the cylinder you'd get this response and it will be garbage yeah, so a lot of people would think, hey, well, if a circle is the best, then the cylinder must be second best because that's still a circle. And the reason why it's not is because if you take a cylinder and you put the speaker directly in the center, which is what it's zooming here, and that's why it's showing you that in the graph, your diffraction point's the exact same at every, every distance. And so you're just adding, and anytime you're having a, a problem with diffraction, it's it's just adding to it every at, you know, every time it hits the baffle at that same thing. That's why they're showing you the rectangle is different than the square, right? Because the square, if you got it in a cube, then it's hitting that diffraction point all at the same time at the same distance. That's why uh, the rectangle is different because you're hitting it uh, at different points. And that's why I tell you, like, if you're going to put it in a rectangle, make sure that your sides spacing, like if you're going to put it directly in the center, make sure your side spacing is different from your top spacing. Uh, that's going to cut down on your diffraction. And these waves here, these peaks and these valleys, these up and downs, they're all, they're correlated with each other. Um, I think that this is, this is slightly above 1K. This is slightly above 2K. So it's a, a doubling of the frequency. So this would be slightly above 4K, I think. Uh, no, that's not right. Yeah, above 4K. So basically they're going to happen in these kind of multiples of each other. And when you move up to this green line in this rectangular cabinet, you don't have the same effect. It's not as severe and harsh. So the basic premise, though, is if you are looking for the, the best cabinet for diffraction, then it's going to be a, a cylinder. Now, whether you have the way or means of being able. Yeah, I'm sorry, a sphere, not the cylinder of a sphere. And if uh, if you have the means of being able to create one, then that's the type of enclosure that you would like to put it in. And if you see high-end speakers that all have these spheres on there, 
then they're doing it for that diffraction. However, there's still an issue. Like if you put them on multiple spheres, there's still the issue that you have, which has to do with your center to center spacing. And we're not going to talk about that so much today, but just keep in mind that there's always trade-offs. So just because sphere is necessarily the best doesn't mean it is completely the best. And you got another super chat. Uh, looks like, uh, I don't know if we missed one or not, but El Fuego uh, has helped us out with a little donation to the cause. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate that a whole lot. Yes, thank you very much. Let's show that. El Fuego is also one of my patrons over on Patreon. So we appreciate all the support. A lot of my patrons are on the call. So I always appreciate y'all for, for helping out with making the videos. We couldn't make them without you. That's interesting that they recommend sealed boxes only. I mean, that's a pretty high EBP. Well, the, an EBP of 75 should should mean you could do it really in either one, but it does lean more towards a, a ported box. I, I'm interested to see what you come up with with that. What what year is that old school solo barrack? How, how old school is that? Because the solo barracks were, were those 90s, were those early 2000s? Anybody remember when the old school solo barracks came out? The S10C? Because my understanding is they were made specifically to work well in small sealed enclosures, uh, regardless of the EBP. Well, you know, one of the things that might be going on here too is the FS. We don't know what the FS of this driver is. If the FS is really high, then it may still not do great in the ported box, you know? But hey, it's easy enough like now it's easy enough for anyone to go ahead and design it in WinISD and take a look at it. I mean, that's a good thing about it. Yeah. I looked it up. I, it doesn't, I don't see it. The information it just shows the sealed box. It should be in. Right. Just says, put this in this sealed box. Here you go. It shows you the QTS, but it doesn't show you anything else for what I found. Uh, Cadence, so interesting story about Cadence. This has, this is a little aside. So Cadence makes car audio. Everyone knows that. But Cadence used to make home audio as well. In fact, I had a Klipsch 12-inch subwoofer that went out and they went on clearance. Their Cadence did 12-inch subwoofers. And these were kind of cool because what they would do is you could hook up a phone line in between the two, like the old school phone line. And then what it would do is it would slave your other subwoofer to it. So if you had two cadence 12 inch home theater subwoofers, you could use the volume control of just one of them and it'd turn up the volume of both of them. These were these were active powered subwoofers. Yeah, of course. Yeah, because okay, they're, okay. they're home theater subwoofers. Yeah. Gotcha. So active yes, powered yes. home theater subwoofers. And they, they were not bad. I think they were like 200 bucks or something. I mean, and they were heavy. I so but it wasn't like we're like strapping. It was more like like a signal control thing where one controlled the other. So the funny, yes, one controlled. the. So it was a master and slave. One became your master and one became your slave. It just, you know, that one control would do that. And the cool thing is like, so I, I love that subwoofer. It was more of a mid bass, but I love that subwoofer. And um, my very first video on YouTube, which was not on this channel. Well, it's on this channel, but it, it wasn't designed for this channel. Thank you, Baba. Thank you, Baba, again. <laughs> oh, is that the second one? That's the second one. Yes. Oh, yes. wow. Thank and, you. And Baba is right, y'all. The, the thing you got to remember about this YouTube game, things like watching a video all the way through, actually YouTube, that gets YouTube very excited when you watch an entire video, uh, sharing, hitting the yes. thumbs up button, commenting. Um, and of course, you know, any you know, financial support directly, not everyone can do that. And we really appreciate the people who can, but, um, but you know, those thumbs, they matter. That's how YouTube knows you know, that, that other people should get to look at this. And so if you don't click on the video, YouTube will take that to mean you don't like the video and won't show it to anybody. Yes. Um, we thank you very much. We really do appreciate it. And I, I'm glad too, because that kind of helps us know what content to bring you guys, what content you're enjoying, what content you're not enjoying. And so it's kind of nice to know that you guys are enjoying at least this talk about box design, because I think box design is one of those things that a lot of people take for granted. They just think, oh, it's easy. I'll just throw it in a box. And one of the things that I would have liked to have shown you more in WinISD is even the size of the sealed box you put it in determines how much power you can give it. Period. Yes. If you if you give it too much, someone had asked earlier about, thank you, David. 
as Another well. one. Thank you, David. David. Thank you, David. That uh, that is. You guys are gonna. We're gonna get up. So I'm just gonna. You're about you, to make man, Nick I, emotional. He's about to get emotional yeah. now. He's 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 feeling the love. Uh, well, <laughs> as had, am I. Thank you, gentlemen. It's, it's true. I, I've had a really rough month this past month, and some of you guys know this already. Some of you guys are my patrons, you know, but in the past month, uh, I've lost two people dear to me. Uh, to that's the we're way too young. Uh, the last one was my uncle on Saturday. And so it's been a really rough month. <laughs> and so I haven't even got very many videos out because of it. So yeah, it really does mean a lot. And you know, that you guys are still here, even, you know, when we haven't been able to be here as much as has been a lot to me at least. <laughs> and some of you guys like my patrons, they already know about those types of things, but, um, all right, let's get back and talk about enclosures before I, I got a question for you, Nick. Um, you sell, why don't you talk design. for a little while? <laughs> I, I've got a, well, okay. I, I was going to ask you the question because I wanted to answer the question myself. Um, I, you know, uh, Nick and I both offer enclosure designs for sale. I don't, I don't sell a lot of them. Uh, I've got a few pre-made designs that people can go to my, my Teespring store and get them. Uh, yes. Condolences, condolences, Nick. Um, it's, it's rough when people we care about when we lose them. Um, but, uh, you know, if someone wanted to do an enclosure design, I've got a price list up on my on my blog. And every now and then someone calls me up. And so someone wanted to design for a big 18-inch subwoofer. And I just kind of wanted to show you all what I do whenever I design a subwoofer. Um, I, I jump into WinISD and I work out the, the port tuning and I look at all the various details and everything uh, to make sure I've got it where I think it's going to sound right. And then I jump into a spreadsheet and do a bunch of math in a spreadsheet. And I like to draw out my designs in SketchUp. And, uh, and when I'm done, I, I use there's an add-in for SketchUp called um, layout. And when I'm done, I get a nice, you know, professional looking product with measurements and stuff. So you can actually use plans like this to build off of. I need you to teach and, me a uh, layout portion. Cause I don't oh, know. Layout's a Royal pain in the rear end. I need to offload that to somebody else. If I can get one of my kids <laughs> to do it for me, cause it's so labor intensive. And one thing that's kind of cool here in SketchUp is if you're going to use layout, Nick, this is a tip for you. You want to set up scenes in SketchUp and those will be your images in layout or else it's just way too labor intensive. And so I have these presets for different views and stuff. And so if you order plans from me, you get something like this. Um, and I always do a nice uh, like a plywood look or something simply because it looks better. Um, I tend to take my internal bracing and stuff and make it. Uh, a different uh, different color just to highlight that it's internal bracing. So that's what I do when I design plans. So if someone wanted to reach out to me and say, hey, Justin, can you design some plans? This is what you're going to get, but with the measurements on it so you can see the exact dimensions. Um, and my cat has moved over to me and she's gotten to this habit of biting my toes when I'm standing at my desk. So if I suddenly start cussing, y'all will know why. Um, <laughs> it's about to get exciting in here. Uh, but, uh, but here's a design that, I've, that I'm working on right now. It is a, a big, probably about eight cubic foot ported enclosure for an 18 inch subwoofer, holes for a pair of six inch aero ports and just way too much bracing. Um, <laughs> uh, one thing about bracing that I think people need to understand is that bracing isn't there to make the box stronger. Bracing is there to cut down on panel resonance. And so when you're putting bracing like this, these little, those little notches I have in the side of the enclosure, you want to put those at irregular intervals so that all the panels are basically different size so they'll all resonate at different frequencies. If they're all resonating at the same frequency, it'll be louder and you can hear the panel resonance. Well, you might be able to hear it. So just a few things to think about when you're designing an enclosure. Yeah, spacing out bracing can help frequencies bounce off of it at different lengths. You don't want them in multiples of each other. You don't want them the same distance apart. If you take a big panel like I've got on the screen and divide it in half, then you have two panels that are going to be vibrating at, at a different frequencies, but vibrating together and making making noise. And it's probably more of a more relevant for a mid bass or something. I don't think a big subwoofer like this, when you throw fifteen hundred watts at this eighteen, everything in the damn room is going to be shaking. So you're not going to hear anything else but that. So. Two questions were asked earlier that I, I do want to get to. And by the way, that's really cool. I, I do like that. So Harry asked, I don't know if you saw I posted above toy, which I didn't. What do you think about putting a higher mid base driver into an ultra small enclosure with separate dedicated base driver, like an ideal three-way? So I, I have no problem with that. Typically a three-way, and I just want to mention this. So if you're going to do like a three-way box design, what it's going to look like is assuming your tweeter is sealed, which most of them are, uh, 
that's going to be in, it could be in any cavity. It doesn't matter if it's in the mid base cavity. It doesn't matter if it's in the main cavity. It doesn't make any difference. And then your subwoofer would be in its own separate uh, cavity. So what you might have is a big old box, right? Say a huge box, say 48 inches tall, but you might just have a very small enclosure behind your mid base. And that's fine. As long as it gives you the frequency response that you want and the extension, then there's no reason not to do that. I mean, and you have to, otherwise your, your base, you, you need to put it in its own enclosure, by the way, you, you have to. That's most the, of the, the Dinos are like that. The Dinos have a small enclosure for the mid uh, and the mid in that uh, design is of course a full range driver, uh, but it's a four inch little full range driver is no way you can get down to the low frequency. So there's nothing wrong with putting it in a sealed enclosure. Even if it's under, undersized, you're, you're not going to get base out of a four inch driver. None, none to speak of at least. Um, yeah, and the well, you kill. can. I mean, I've gotten base out of four inch drivers before, but it takes a huge ported enclosure. Sounds sloppy as hell, but uh, but no, that's exactly what you want to do. And so, why do we not see more infinite baffle? I have my ideas. Of, I want to hear yours too, Justin. The reason why I don't think we see more infinite baffle is infinite baffle just can't handle as much power. Typically, mm -hmm. you have to have mm -hmm. a high excursion, doesn't right. handle as much power. So, to get to the SPL levels that you typically want to get to, you'll just need multiples of that subwoofers, and subwoofers are. Uh, relatively expensive. Now, there is definitely times and places for infinite baffle. If you can reach your attic and you don't want to build a box necessarily, hey, great place to do it. Or if you're in a basement and you have a wall that's facing some other room that you don't need to utilize that, then hey, infinite baffle all the way. You can use those. But it's, for a lot of people, just building a big ported box is is just as what? hard. And it's, and it's, in the long run, ends up being cheaper because you only need one subwoofer, right? You know, the infinite baffle, um, for a while there, there was this thing that was kind of trendy where you would make a manifold and put, say, I don't know, four 18s in the little box and uh, and like and build that box into your ceiling. And basically your attic becomes the baffle and an infinite baffle kind of setup. Um, and that's neat and cool. And, and you basically get this, you know, you know, big vent in your roof with that has a, or your ceiling with four 18 inch subwoofer sitting in there, but it takes a lot of power and you know, people are throwing four or 5,000 Watts in their home system. In a car, you see that uh, there's a brand called image dynamics and they're real famous for like a pair of 15s, infinite baffle in a big car. Um, so you're basically using the entire trunk as a baffle. So those are some cool stuff. Now who are some well, of the best I, speaker makers now? Well, I want to say this too. All right, guys. So, we just had Elliot was on the channel not too long ago. Elliot's a very bright, intelligent guy. We love Elliot. And I would like to get him back on the channel again. What do you think about that? Would you like to get him back on Sound Advice sometime? I'd love to. I'd love to. I know it's in the middle of the <laughs> middle of the night, <laughs> the next day forward or something. So like well, not today, but yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm thinking what we could do is, you know, maybe one on DSP. He 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 does a lot of DSP. Um, you and I are relatively uh, I, I can't say novice because we're we're not novice novice, but we're we're definitely not. Oh, up there I'm like other people. Are I'm either. in the early steps of the Dunning Kruger effect when it comes to DSP. I know just enough to think I know something. So that might be a good idea. We might maybe we'll get him on there. Wow, Wes, holy cow! Thank you very much. Where did he come from? He just came from nowhere. I, Wes hasn't even said anything, and then hits us with that one. Wes, Wes it's nice to meet you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Oh, yeah. You have no idea how much we you guys have been way too kind today. And I, I really do appreciate it. And I did read all the condolences. And I didn't want to mention it because I probably will cry on air if I think about it too much. Um, But I do. Thank you. All, all of you guys for it. it. It has meant a lot to me. <sighs> that's that's Big your time. turn. Been kind of a heavy show, man. We got to see if we can lighten it up a little bit. But Infinite Baffle is really cool. Uh, I'd like to be able to do um, Infinite. Baba just dropped another one. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Thank you. We, we, we is really appreciated. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much. This actually, this actually lightened up the account. So thank you. <laughs> no crying, just audio. Um, right. There's no crying in subwoofers. So anyways, but I like the idea of an infant. <laughs> it's just impractical. It's just impractical. I mean, huge, you know, huge subwoofers, <laughs> amounts of amounts of power and lots of X max and, and giant, giant, you know, walls. It's, it's, it's cool stuff, but not practical. 
We love you, but not the other way. <laughs> I, I think I get that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, so I want to just kind of end it on also talking about why someone might do sealed because we don't see someone asked me not too long ago. Why don't you ever do any sealed um, speakers? And that it's not true. I do I do sealed speakers, but I, I don't do a lot. And I think that's partially because of the way that driver manufacturers manufacture drivers now. Almost everyone is manufacturing them in a way that just works so darn good in ported that it almost doesn't doesn't add up to do sealed. The one exception was when I got the wave core drivers. When I got those wave core drivers, I had that six and a half inch wave core that one of my patrons actually ended up picking up off me off a garage sale. And I built a sealed box with the wave core mid, which was six and a half inch glass fiber and tweeter. And those were some of the best speakers I have ever designed. They sounded so good and I loved them. And so, you know, if you really want more sealed, I, I think part of it would be you know, talking to the people that manufacture drivers, because I'm not saying there aren't any out there because that's just a lie. But when you take a look in general at what people are making, even like the small little bookshelf speakers, you're seeing almost all of them are ported or use some type of passive radiator nowadays. And I think what you hit it on earlier was, hey, the, there's just so much more low end efficiency mm -hmm. with them. And their music now is tailored more to bass, a lot of it. And I think, unfortunately... That's just the way that people are going. I mean, even headphones now, often cheaper headphones are designed to be, uh, to play over, like, you know, right. overemphasize your bass, your mid bass now. Um, minus, I just got some Edifier stacks in and the, the review's coming out. I missed, I was trying to get it out Sunday. I missed the, my date to get it out. But those Edifier stacks, by the way, those are ones that don't overemphasize and they sound so good, but they're playing our headphones and playing our headphones are just, I mean, pop, uh, pop my screen up real quick. So I want to show you, show you something here. Uh, so this right here, don't know how well y'all can see that there's the black line and the red line. The black line is uh, the enclosure I just showed you and it's an extended base shelf. So it's got that, it, it trails off early and kind of flattens out about three dB down. And you can see that you just got a whole lot more low end extension down below 50 Hertz. You've just got a whole lot more um, output coming from the black line, which is the sealed version, or excuse me, the ported version. And the red line is the sealed version and it, it runs out of steam quicker. And that is the reason why you see especially a small bookshelf leaning towards ported because those things just don't have enough, you know, a six and a half inch bookshelf driver. You're not going to get a huge amount of base out of it. Uh, if you look at the SPL, when the amplifier is cranked up, it's not as big a difference. Uh, you still get some, I mean, this thing, 20 Hertz can still give you a hundred decibels. Um, so with a really big you know, 18 inch subwoofer like this, I think going with a, a sealed works just fine. But you go with the ported because you're trying to get more base out of a small, small driver. Uh, takes more space to do ported. The sealed enclosure was, um, you know, a quarter of the size of the ported enclosure. So, you know, there you go. There's trade offs. Uh, but I'm beginning to warm up to the idea of doing a sealed and I'm planning on doing a few videos over the next few weeks. Uh, next few months, looking at some stuff with sealed enclosures, comparing different size sealed enclosures. And just I've already cut the wood for some test boxes. So I'm going to be building some sealed enclosures uh, in the future. So. so here's where I'm thinking sealed works best right now. And sealed to, for me, where it works best right now is with very large subwoofers. Mm -hmm. When I say large, like I'm saying more than 18 inches, although 18 inches, it works too. Yeah. yeah. But when you're looking at those 21, 24 inch to do a ported box is like unrealistic. And most right, you're, you're, you're 10 cubic feet for a ported box. And that's kind of put it in a four cubic foot sealed box. That's better. Well, and you think about it, say a four cubic foot sealed box, 21. And so let's just say it starts dropping off by like 40 hertz it's a very slow decline we all know mm -hmm. that right? right so your room's gonna, gonna pick that floor. up and and with that much air moving being able to be picked up you shouldn't need necessarily a ton of eq to get it down real low so for me 21 24 inch sealed all the way um, and let me go back to the share let me show you one more thing that i think is is a bit of a um a benefit of going with a large sealed enclosure so again this is a big 18 inch driver uh, is it, you got it? Yep. 
So the red line is the cone excursion for the big 18 inch driver in the sealed enclosure. At no point does it get above its X max at 12 millimeters, which isn't a big X max, but it's a huge driver. The other one, uh, anytime you're below about, looks like about 24 Hertz, you're above X max. And if this is for home theater, you're, you're going to, you know, it's going to sound pretty crappy down there. And so you've got this, you know, huge excursion at 20 Hertz. So if you really want to get to those lows, maybe that big ported box isn't the way to go. And so here's the deal. I'm going to mention this. Keep that up for a minute. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and go to um, go over to your left hand side down at the bottom and click yeah. on fil click on filters. You see filters there? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now go ahead and click at and put a 20 hertz high pass there. 20 hertz high pass. I think you want the link with transform, don't you? No, nope, I want a high pass at 20 hertz. <laughs> I pass. exactly what I said. 20 hertz order cue yeah. Butterworth. Now just keep it, just keep everything the same. You're fine. It's set, right. set second order. No, you did it on the sealed one. Yes, yes, I see that now. Let me go back to the ported. Yeah. Add a filter, low pass, high pass, so twenty any, hertz. Path. Anytime you go past your, um, anytime you go past your tuning frequency, you're going to have excursion issues. Now you can see that him adding a twenty hertz high pass has helped that out a little. Didn't help but, it out a lot. So let's no. go ahead and increase that high pass to 30 hertz, uh, 25 hertz. All righty. Just double click on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm working on it. Uh, That's your yeah. infrasonic filter. So you want that. Um, I think I've got this tuned to 30 hertz. So, but I think a 30 hertz infrasonic works better on this one. So in car audio, a lot of your car audio amplifiers, for example, have an adjustable high pass on it. When you're designing a box in here, you're going to want to change that 30 hertz. So now click on your transfer function magnitude. Oof. So now, but you're protecting your driver. Now, now unclick, right. unclick your high pass on it. No, click. Hang on, look at the SVL difference. Let me. Uh... Now you difference. A lot of that you'll make up with cabin gain anyway. Oh but yeah. The point being is when you're designing a box inside or an enclosure inside something like Win ISD. Pay attention to that high pass because that high pass will take care of that cone excursion afterwards and allow you to pay more. David, geez, thank you guys. I need to go in and hit the like button. Everyone, <laughs> yeah, everyone hit it but you. <laughs> Everyone's hit it but me. I need to go in and hit the like button. <laughs> yes, guys, please. Thank you, David, once again. I, I really do appreciate it. This guy is, has meant a lot to me. I I am not going to say how I don't, I don't know how to talk anymore. But uh, thank you. All right. So, hey, um, let's talk about it's our it's it's um, it is after eight. So let's talk about what we have coming up next. Uh, uh, if that's OK with you, Nick, um, I mentioned a few minutes ago what I've got coming next on my channel. I am planning to do a, uh, a series of sealed subwoofer enclosures. Uh, probably spread those out over the next few months. Actually, we drop about once a month because I got some like a series I want to have done. So that will be coming up on my channel in the future. So make sure that you're over there and telling your friends about it. And in addition to that, I'm wrapping up another bookshelf speaker build. I've got a uh, Baba again with a super chat. David again with the super chat. Just tons of them everywhere today. Thank you all so much. Um, so I've got another bookshelf speaker build. I've got some of the C notes from Parts Express uh, that I have. Um, <laughs> yes, both Nick and I, Eric, would be glad to take on that design challenge uh, for us. But um, but I'm doing a pair of C notes. I've got the crossovers wired up. Just got to put the drivers in and edit the video. And I've got another prefab box review. I have found what might be the best bargain prefab box on the market. Ooh. So sometime in the next two weeks, uh, the best ever prefab uh, a bargain prefab box is going to be uh, posted on my channel. So uh, funny, Eric had said, hey, you know, help me realize that I need to pay someone else to sign me a box. Well, that's not really what our, our, our goal is. So honestly, if you guys have questions or problems with box design, head over to the forum. We'd be happy to look it over and tell you if there's anything that we see. The biggest thing that I just say is take some pictures of some of the graphs. Even if you don't know how to read them, just take pictures and post them on there. That way we can help you read them yourself and we can teach you what to look for and what not to look for. Once you know what to look for and what not to look for, this makes designing boxes easier. Um, 
I do just want to say really quickly. Um, I don't know that I really want to say it quickly, but I really appreciate you guys. Um, I know I speak of me and Justin both. We really do appreciate you guys. And a lot of times when we get on air, it's easy to think about us just being information. And tonight you guys really made us feel like people again. And um, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I mean, who thinks that you're going to be talking to someone on the internet and be sharing? I, I didn't, I wasn't planning on sharing any of that tonight, but I feel like I needed to. And then you guys responded in a way that I never anticipated. Um, and I don't just mean the super chats. I also mean just your words of encouragement. And I really do appreciate that. So thank you guys a lot. And then <laughs> thank you, Baba. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys. Um, it makes me feel like I have nothing good to say after this. I, I, uh, I, I have, I mainly have reviews coming out right now. I, I am working on behind the scenes. I'm working on the Epic build. We call it the Epic build because it's using the Dayton Epic drivers. And that's a really cool build. And I, I'm going to be starting cutting that out this week. I had to wait on a few parts to come in and those parts have come in. So hopefully I have everything there and el fuego thank you again sound advice fan since day one keep it up and you have you have been here since day one and we know that thank you so much uh wes thank you <laughs> you're gonna have yeah you're gonna talk for a while <laughs> <laughs> okay wes thank you very much uh we really appreciate all of you uh and we really appreciate the large amount of super chats that y'all have provided for us tonight uh, those things do matter. And of course, you, you've, uh, you've, you've, you've obviously, Nick, Nick is like, yeah, they do matter a whole lot. And I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm speechless. I'm not speechless often. Uh, it doesn't take, takes a lot to get me to, to shut up. <laughs> uh, and I'm doing that nervous laughter thing. Nothing funny about, uh, about this. This is awesome. Thank you guys. Uh, it's, it's, it's very encouraging to see, uh, those kind of super chats like that. Uh, they do help us, uh, you know, they help us know that we're doing what we're trying to do because Nick and I have talked about this and we look at the numbers of the views on the live stream. And we're thinking to ourselves, hey, are we having the impact that we need to have? Are we reaching people? Are we connecting with people? Are we helping people build better audio? Um, and and so uh, when you when you show us those kind of super chats, that tells us that maybe you weren't having a big impact on a Maybe we're not having a large impact in terms of numbers, maybe we're having a large impact in terms of impact on people. And that's what's and that's what's cool about the super chats. And that's the thing that I think that's part of what's making Nick a little bit uh, stunned and speechless there is that it's like, hey, this is evidence that we're actually doing something that you find extremely valuable. And that that makes us want to do it more uh, because that means we know we're doing something right. And that's the way I interpret, uh, I interpret super chats. Thank you, Mark Andrew. We appreciate the $20 super chat. And again, you know, um, the money is nice, but it's more of the, Hey, that's, you're telling us that what we're doing matters and, and, and doing something that matters is really what, I don't know what most men want in life, right? That's, that's the thing. If it boils down to, <laughs> Uh, you know, you had those days at work where your day job sucks. Why does it suck? Because it feels like it doesn't matter. That's when yeah. that's when life sucks, right? But when you feel like you've made a difference in someone's life, when you feel like people uh, care about what you do, you know, that's uh, that's the moment where things are going well. Yeah, it really does uh, validate. I think that's the word we're looking for, validate. And so I, I appreciate it, you guys. Um, I know... Justin obviously does as well. And I gotta be honest, I'm looking forward to the Epic video as well. I think you guys are going to really like it. They're going to end up being more like mini towers or, or big bookshelves. However you, you want to look at it. All right, guys, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to go before I, I can't talk anymore. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. You guys, you guys have no idea how much today has meant to all of us. So thank you very much. Hey, and we love you guys too. And you guys have a great week. We will, Catch you Monday for sure. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll see you next week on my channel. So.